In this new segment of Advisor Revelations, the DPL team will discuss how to evaluate new solutions and address current challenges and the strategies that can help you grow your firm and AUM. Welcome, Jonathan Clements, to A Day at DPL, a a podcast we've been running for the last number of years, talking to a lot of thought leaders in financial services and getting their perspectives on what they're seeing, what they're thinking about, what they're researching. And we're super excited to have Jonathan on uh, today. Jonathan Clements is the founder and editor of Humble Dollar. Uh, He is also the author of a handful of personal finance books, including My Money Journey, which is his latest, and How to Think About Money. Uh, He's also quite familiar with financial advisors as he sits on the advisory board for Creative Planning. And, which is one of the country's largest independent uh, advisory firms. So welcome, Jonathan. David, it's great to be on your podcast. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. So terrific. As you can tell from the name of my firm, I'm horrible at naming. Uh, just DPL, financial partners, completely non-creative. So tell me a little bit about Humble Dollar. How did you come up with the name and you know, tell me what you what you cover there. So Humble Dollar came into being right at the end of 2016. And prior to that, I had blogged every week or so on a website, uh, JonathanClements.com. But I had this notion that I wanted to create a site that had it didn't hinge on, on my name. So I spent months actually trying to come up with a name for this site. And if you've ever spend any time with GoDaddy, you'll know that all of the good URLs have been taken years ago, years ago. And I had been playing with various ideas, you know, around sort of money and being rational uh, and being humble, because I think that's important to managing money. And somewhere in the middle of the night, this notion humbledollar.com came to me. So I got out of bed two in the morning, you know, went to my laptop, went to GoDaddy, plugged in HumbleDollar.com, and sure enough, it was available for $10.99, whatever the price was at the time. And that's how I ended up with the name. And in the years since, the website has evolved. Initially, my goal was just to blog myself maybe once a week, maybe have a few other people blog. Uh, But the primary reason for launching the site was to take this annual financial guide that I've been putting out just putting it on the web and making it freely available. I I didn't have aspirations much larger than that. But in the years since, the website has taken on a life of its own. I mean, today, you know, I'm typically putting up, you know, one or two pieces of content every day. The amount of traffic has gone from, you know, where I have, you know, maybe a couple of thousand page views in a day to today where, you know, pretty much every day I'm seeing, you know, 10 to 20,000 page views on the site. Uh, it's really, it has taken on a life of its own and it's sort of the, the beast that has eaten my life. I would actually like to be more retired than I am, but instead, you know, I end up working these very long days just to keep the site going. Yeah, that's a terrific a victim of your own success. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> So let me just go back in time a little bit, David. Um, As some listeners will know, I spent 20 years at the Wall Street Journal. uh, And then uh, for six years, I was on what my uh, old reporter friends were called the dark side. I spent six years at Citigroup, where I was uh, director of financial education for the wealth management business. So essentially, I've dealt with the financial world from, from two different angles, from the inside and from the outside, which gives me, I like to think, a unique perspective. Anyway, having worked at Citigroup for six years and, you know, got to the point where I was really sick of dealing with legal and compliance, probably something that your listeners are also (laughs) well used to, I decided to uh, strike out on my own. I did a variety of things. I taught personal finance at the college level for a while. I uh, worked on a financial startup. I uh, did a couple of books. I got involved with creative planning. And in the course of all this, I also put out this annual financial guide. I did it a couple of 
years in a row. And then I realized that technology was really passing me by. I mean, I could only update this book once a year and it really needed to be updated continuously. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to throw this onto the web. And that's how Humble Dollar was born initially. So one of the things that Humble Dollar has become well known for is people writing about their own finances. So the site has a crew of perhaps 50 uh, amateur writers. Uh, most of them are just everyday Americans who have a keen interest in personal finance. There are some financial advisors who write for the site. But in terms of the everyday investors who write for the site, uh, one of the things that I say to them all the time is you may, may not be an expert on the financial world, but you are an expert on your own life. So if you talk about what you've done personally with your finances, you can do so with some authority. And as a consequence, one of the things that has come out is that we've run a series of essays, which I now, now fall under the rubric of my money journey, where people describe their financial journey, how they went from their early adult years to a financially secure retirement, for the book, what we did was we took 30 of those essays and you know, put them between two covers and created what I think is a pretty compelling read about how people do reach financial independence. And of course, one of the things that you discover is, and this will be no surprise to most financial advisors, is that people don't get there by making brilliant financial decisions. They don't get there by you know, buying Tesla on the IPO. They instead get there by saving diligently year after year, decade after decade, shoving that money into the 401k plan, making mediocre investment decisions. But if they do that for enough years, guess what? You end up with a significant sum of money. And most of the stories in the book really fall into that category. People who just did the right thing for many decades and ended up with more wealth than they ever imagined. Yeah. And that, and that's the key, you know, being diligent and sticking to a plan. And like you said, if, if you're hearing from investors who are talking about, they made their money on the Tesla IPO, it's, it's, it's like talking to gamblers who always win, right? The, you know, they don't tell you about the losses. I'm sure there were some losses off, offsetting that kind of strategy, but it's that diligence of, you know, sticking to a plan, you know, continually contributing and, and building up, you know, wealth over time, not looking to, you know, hit lottery tickets. And I think that comes to an important point, which is, you know, it's very rare that we have an honest conversation about money. I mean, advisors may be able to have that with their clients, but in terms of everyday conversations about money, you know, it is full of testosterone. People lie about their financial situation all the time. In fact, you know, Adult males lie more about money than teenage boys lie about their sexual experience. I mean, it's just it goes on and on. You know, if you've ever been to a cocktail party and talk to people about how they invest, you know, you would imagine they are all multi-million millionaires because all they talk about are their successes. And yet that's not reality. We know that's not reality. And one of the things I like to think about humble dollar in general and the book my money journey that came out of it is this is people talking honestly about how they handled their finances about the mistakes they made and what were the keys to their financial success and you know as you picked up you know it's really very prosaic it's saving money month after month year after year decade after decade hopefully making reasonably intelligent investment decisions but not always still and I think this, we'll get to this in our conversation a little bit later. You know, when we talk about that, what we're talking about in many, I think, is the easy part of financial management, which is the accumulation stage. You know, accumulating money is sort of brute force over ignorance. If you just keep sucking away that money, even if you're a lousy investor, you will get to retirement with a significant sum. It's the people who don't save at all who, who have the problems. But if you do say even if you don't make good choices, you're going to arrive at retirement with a decent amount of money. But then 
you get to that really tricky part, which is how do you turn that into a stream of income that's going to last as long as you do? Right. And, and one of the things before we get to that in retirement, one of, one of the things that I think is interesting about you, know, you talking about the journey and hearing from people is I, I'm fascinated with kind of behavioral finance and psychology around investors and how it changes over time. Right. So, you know, you're, you know, 30 years old and you're, you know, willing to take all kinds of risks. And then, you know, as you age, you know, that typically changes. You approach that you know, retirement date and all of a sudden, you know, you get allergic to losing money. Um, and so, you know, can you talk about some of that journey and, you know, both of your own and, and what you see on your site? So one of the things, David, that's interesting about financial journeys is that even as we get older and we should sort of rationally become, you know, less willing to take risk because our time horizon is shorter and we're living off our savings and our human capital is going away. By that point, the funny thing is that most of us actually become more risk tolerant, at least from a personal point of view. You know, we're actually more comfortable with stock markets ups and downs. We're more willing to hold on through a market decline, you know, when you get into the depths of bear markets, you know, who are the people who are buying? It's not, you know, the 20 year olds who are, you know, in love with AMC and GameStop. The people who are buying stocks at the bottom are the old folks like me who have been through some market cycles and realize that this is the time when you should be buying. The problem is at that point, there's limited value to that knowledge because you can't go all in on stocks when you're age 65. You need to have some money set aside to pay for your living costs in the years ahead. So you may be, from a personal point of view, more risk tolerant at that juncture. And yet, objectively, you should be less risk tolerant. Yes. And, and so let's transition to retirement a bit. I mean, somebody told me once upon a time, you know, as all these, you know, robo advisors were, were the rage, you know, a number of years ago that, you know, on the accumulation side, like you said, it's relatively straightforward. You know, if, if you do the right things, if you save money, you invest it, you kind of let it ride, you know, you know, stay the course, and, you know, and, you know, you can get a reasonable outcome. Um, and so along those lines, like the development of a robo advisor, I was told is, you know, some number of thousands of lines of code to create a robo advisor. Now, if you want to apply that to decumulation or, or retirement in layman's terms, that's hundreds of thousands of lines of code, right? It's, it's of orders of magnitudes more complicated, you know, so, and, and I, you know, talk about this a lot. I think retirement is more complicated today than it's ever been, you know, the duration of retirement's longer. You can be looking at 30 years. You're largely self-funding. Pensions are going away. Um, Social Security will will be around, but will benefits be lowered? You know, who who knows? You know, in you know what changes may occur. You know, may occur there. But it is a it becomes a real challenge where you're looking at pretty much self-funding a 30 plus year retirement, and that's not. So easy is just putting money away and keeping it invested. And on top of that, you know, when we think about retirement, it's not just about the income stream. There are also the potential for big expenses such as long term care. You know, we're also dealing with major housing issues. People also need to think about estate planning. It is indeed far more complicated. One of the things that and this is a bit of a digression, but one of the things that drives me nuts about the financial conversation we have in this country is it is all about investing. It's 90 percent about you know what gets discussed on CNBC, what's hot, what's not, you know, which way is the market going, what's happening to interest rates. And yet, if you look at people's financial lives, there are three other crucial areas beyond investing that they need to be thinking about. You know, the second area is these larger financial issues. You know, what about their estate plan? You know, what about their housing situation? Do they have the right insurance? I mean, these are important issues and these are issues where, you know, a good advisor can add a lot more value than they can to figuring out the exact right allocation between stocks and bonds. You know, that topic we spend way too much time on. And then, you know, beyond that, you know, we need to think about these behavioral issues, you know. How do we keep people invested in the market? How do we make sure that they are comfortable with what they own? You know, how do they, uh, you would get people to 
have happier financial lives, which brings me to sort of the fourth aspect of managing money, which is, you know, what does money mean to people? What is it that they want from their financial lives? And that's a question that becomes front and center when you reach retirement. You know, you, you need to replace this thing that you used to have a job that used to give you a sense of purpose and to find some way to give a sense of purpose to what's meant to be this goals and period of your life when you are purportedly financial financially independent and able to do whatever you want. And for a lot of people, retirement is a big disappointment. And so figuring out what money means to people so that they can have a fulfilling retirement, you know, that is a hugely important issue. And it's a lot more important than deciding that you should have 58% in stocks rather than 60. Yeah. And, and I see that so much, like particularly, and you said that gets amplified in retirement, you know, in during the investing years, you know, it's, you know, financial advisors, tend to be focused on numbers and out, you know, and per, because they're disciplined around investing and probabilities and let's stay invested and, and let's consider the numbers and the math and the probabilities and the allocations and all that. Now you get to retirement, things, money gets a little more personal, right? Even, even more personal than during accumulation, because now you've got this nest egg that you've got to live on. Like you said, your, your human capital, your working capital um, is, likely no longer there, or, you know, maybe you've got some, you can get some kind of part-time job or something like that, but presumably you're going to be living off your, your savings. And now psychology, emotion, person, you know, personal preferences really start driving that. And one of the things that, you know, we know about uh, retirees that comes from the academic research is that those who have predictable income such as a large stream of social security that covers a lot of their costs, or they have a traditional company pension, those folks tend to be happier retirees. Most folks who are just living solely on a portfolio of stocks and bonds with all the uncertainty that's involved are not nearly as happy as the people who have that predictable stream of income. So when, when you think about retirement, you know, where we know that if you get it wrong, it really bites, <laughs> you know, having that predictable stream of income is hugely important. Yeah. And, and we've seen that one of the rewarding things, you know, about, you know, the, building this business that we have is, you know, I've built this marketplace of, you know, no load commission free insurance products, particularly annuities and wanted to do that because I thought this is, you know, fiduciary advisors need to be able to use them in their practices. Consumers need to be able to buy them directly without having to deal with a commission salesperson. And so, you know, we largely approach a, a novice annuity user market and we're just, you know, completing a survey, you know, of the, you know, of those users, you know, these advisors who've never really used annuities before have only been doing it since we've been around in the last five years and they report those things back. Right. And that's really rewarding because like part of the reason I'm passionate about annuities is because I, the value I think they can bring you know, to a retiree and to hear advisors tell us back that my clients are better able to stay the course. They're happier in retirement. They, they understand they can spend more with the annuity. Like all the things academic research, you know, tells you about it, you know, about the benefits of an annuity to hear you hear it come back in the real world that your customers are telling you that they're experiencing that is, is, is tremendous. So maybe you can tell me a bit about, you know, your thoughts on annuities and, you know, kind of, you know, how those might have evolved over the years. So, of course, the term annuity is unfortunate because it covers a multitude of sins. Right. And, uh, you know, when we think about annuities, right, there are there are fixed annuities, there are variable annuities, there are tax deferred annuities, there are immediate annuities. And, you know, our particular focus here today is we're talking about immediate annuities. Um, but there are all these other products um, that fall under the annuity label that in, in a sense, you know, yes, they're all sold by insurance companies. But beyond that, they're not as sort of, uh, they're, they're not as, as similar in my mind as they are different. And one of the problems for the insurance industry, and, it, and it's a problem they've created for themselves, is that people hear the word annuity and they run screaming in the opposite direction. And based on the history of the insurance business, you can hardly blame them. You know, you know people's first experience with an annuity might have been, you know, the variable annuity that they were sold by the, you know, uh, an 
security salesman, you know, in the branch when they announced that they had, you know, an extra 10 grand from grandma or something. And that was their introduction to annuities. And suddenly they had this variable annuity they couldn't get out of that they paid a huge back end sales charge if they try to escape. And that is the black eye that the insurance industry has given to itself. And instead, you know, at this point, it should be a golden moment for the life insurance companies. They faced with this wave of retiring baby boomers, they should be in the catbird seat, selling immediate fixed annuities left and right to retirees who need you know, that lifetime income squeezed out of relatively small est- nest eggs that they've managed to amass. But instead, you know, the insurance industry has this huge PR problem. You know, People hear the word annuity and they immediately recoil. And somehow, you know, the insurance industry needs to overcome that if they want to be successful in the decades ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I say it all the time, and it's part of the reason for building the business. The, the root of all evil in annuities is commission, right? So if you, if you look back to, you know, why are there long surrender periods? To recoup commissions. You know, why are there high costs? To recoup commissions. You know, why do you have all kinds of sales features and bells and whistles? So salespeople can sell things to get commissions. You know, and the list goes on and on and on about, you know, how commissions have, you know, dri- and the bad reputation, you know, based on bad sales practices driven by large commissions. I mean, we're not talking about small commissions for, you know, for a transaction. You know, you're talking about 80% of the cost of the product, you know, is, is generally in, in the commission. So it's a very significant problem, you know, for the industry. And I think the only way the industry truly ever solves that PR issue is to say, we're going like the rest of the financial services world to no load, right? There, there, there'll be a small segment where, you know, a commission might make sense for a product, but, you know, we're, we're abandoning the, the commission driven sales model and we're, go, and we're going no load like the rest of the world. But the problem is, you know, making that transition involves a huge one-time cost and insurance companies are not going to be willing to do it. And if, the, if any one insurance company does it, you know, their salesmen will up and move to competing firms, take their book of business with them. I mean, it will be from a company point of view, a disaster. You know, I, I, I was... I was when I was at Citigroup, I mean, it's a different situation, but, but in, a, in a sense similar. When I was at Citigroup, they were trying to move these traditional stockbrokers over to becoming fee-only financial advisors. And the advisors hated it. Some of the biggest producers left. They went to Morgan Stanley. They went to Smith Barney, wherever they went. It was a disaster from a financial point of view in the short term for the company. But it was the right thing to do, and it was the way to get the business on a long-term sustainable trend. I mean, you've seen this also on the, you know, among the only financial advisors. I mean, they've, you know, taken business away from the big brokerage firms for decades now, and the big brokerage firms are hamstrung because they need to keep their sales force happy, and making everybody drop commissions and become the only is just going to make the advisors leave. So I understand the the business dilemma, but you're absolutely right, David. I mean, the way the business should go and where the future is, is with no load products. And the companies that focus on that market are going to be the ones that succeed in the years ahead. So so transitioning a little bit to, you know, talking about, you know, advisors and and clients, you know, we we largely serve an advisor market. We do, you know, handle a lot of, you know, consumer direct uh, you know, transactions where consumers, you know, find out about us. We do a little advertising. So we, we have a direct business, but mostly it's financial advisors. So, you know, one of the things, and, you know, we're talking about retirement and how much more complicated and so many different variables, you know, in, in retirement and factors to consider. Um, what are, you know, what, what's, what's your advice to advisors and how they start to transition their conversations or their dealings with their clients as they approach retirement? I think there are a number of different points that are worth making with clients. I mean, the first one uh, is to talk about how, if you have this predictable income, you're going to be a happier retiree. You know, you don't have to spend all day worrying about, you know, what's going on with interest rates and what's going on with the Dow. You know, you can 
have that comfort of knowing that you're going to get this paycheck, you know, delivered into your checking account every month, thanks to this immediate annuity that you're buying. And that that is a powerful thing. The second thing I would say to a client is, you know, remember, you know, we're not buying a single product here. What we're doing is designing your financial life. And one of the things that happens when you put in an immediate fixed annuity into a portfolio is it frees you to do different things with the rest of the portfolio. So let's say you have enough lifetime income between social security and immediate fixed annuity to cover your fixed living costs. That suddenly gives you substantial freedom to invest the rest of your money in, in some much more aggressive way. So for instance, if you've got money that you want to leave to your kids or grandkids and you want to see it grow over the years ahead, thanks to the lifetime income from Social Security and immediate fixed annuity, you can be much more aggressive with the rest of that portfolio. And the result is that even if you made that big one-time investment into an immediate fixed annuity, you can more than make up for it in the decades ahead, thanks to the higher growth in the rest of your portfolio. And in a sense, you know, you know, it may be a great way to supercharge your portfolio because you are free to take more risk. That's right. And, and that's, again, one of the results we heard back in the survey is not only so it's great to hear advisors say, hey, OK, I get that. You know, I get the logic of that. But now I present it to my customer and we hear back in the survey, the customer's you know, more comfortable, you know, because, again, they've got that security of the guaranteed income, uh, you know, that can you know, bring them that peace of mind of not worrying about the market and be able to take a little more risk you know, with the rest of the portfolio. And the other benefit is you can fund that income need because of the characteristics of the annuity with, with fewer assets. So it doesn't take as much to fund that need. And so then there is more, you know, there are more of the client's assets to invest in those in those strategies. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the big fear is that somebody's going to buy this immediate fixed annuity or they're going to delay Social Security and then they're going to go under the bus tomorrow. Right. That is the big fear. I, now, my joke on this is always, well, you know, it's a decision you're not going to live to regret, right? <laughs> you know, at the point you're dead, all your financial worries are over. Uh, but I realize that probably making those sorts of jokes with clients is not going to make you very popular. I do think that the sale is a lot easier when we're talking about a couple. You know, if, if you're trying to persuade somebody to delay Social Security till age 70, so they know that their spouse will get that larger survivor benefit, you know, that's a sensible thing to do, even if you yourself are in poor health, you know, because you know that your spouse is going to get the survivor benefit. Similarly, you're buying the joint survivor annuity. Even if you're a little concerned about your own mortality, at least you know your spouse will continue to get the income, you know, if you're the one that goes under the bus. I think the other thing that is, and it's related to this, that's worth explaining to clients is this notion of risk pooling. You know, when you think about, you know, this risk that you're going to die young and you're not going to get that much from this investment, it's not the insurance company that's going to be making, you know, boatloads of money off you. It's going to be your fellow annuitants. You know, in a sense, you know, you are the beneficiary of anybody who dies young and they will benefit if unfortunately you don't make it to you know, whatever the break-even age is for an immediate fixed annuity, maybe, you know, 83, 84, depending on, depending on when you buy and interest rates and so on. So, you know, this risk pooling notion, I think, makes buying annuities seem somewhat more palatable. You are not actually enriching some nasty insurance company by, by buying this product. Right. There, the insurance company isn't in the business of taking risk on your your life expectancy, right? They're, they're pooling all that risk. And, and then, you know, they're, they're taking their percentage out of, you know, out of the assets that get invested into that, but they're not, they're not, you know, making, you know, making large bets on, you know, whether, what the market does, what life expectancy does They're you know, they're, they're pooling and aggregating those risks. But, you know, for, for us, we have a, you know, a couple of different things. I mean, one, you make a great point about, you know, when you're looking at joint life, you know, that, you know, it's like, you know, even if one of you passes early or unexpectedly, you know, the likelihood that, you know, the other one, you know, still can, you know, live, uh, you know, a, a normal and long life um, is, is one way to help people get comfortable with it. 
the the other is you know we have you know other products that again once we take the the loads out we have some pretty straightforward products that if you don't want to give up that lump sum sometimes people can't get over that they're still really good competitive products that you know provide you can provide a good stream of income in the same way and then there are other features with those products like period certain so you make sure you're going to get paid for at least 10 years or or whatever it is you give up a little bit on the payout right but you you might get the peace of mind you're looking for uh in in uh you know with some of those features and one of the things that and again i'm not sure whether this will you know i've i've never been a salesman and i'm not sure the way this would sell a client but one of the um things about annuitization is that the academic world is all in favor of it. I mean, they understand the value of risk pooling. um, And they also understand that with a plain vanilla and immediate fixed annuity, these are actually not expensive products. I mean, certainly there are, you know, variable annuities out there, equity index annuities with horrendous internal expenses, um, either explicit or not. But when it comes to immediate fixed annuities, you know, the analyses that I've seen have been that these are a relatively low cost product. You know, if somebody buys one of these products, they are not getting taken to the cleaners, despite what they might imagine, because they've heard all these horror stories about equity indexed annuities and about variable annuities. That, that's right. So, you know, for us, you know, along with, you know, the creation of you know, low cost, no load products, we give technology that enables you to compare. Right. So in what you're saying, you know, is true for, you know, those income annuities because they're so easy to compare. Right. It's like, what's the payout rate? <laughs> you know, what's the rating of the country? What com- uh, company? What's the payout rate? So it makes it really easy to compare. So if you're the insurance carrier, you can't get greedy about those internal expenses because it's very easy to compare. So we try to bring that same you know, capability to other product types where we, you know, can give you the technology, which makes it super simple, you know, to compare the, you know, potential outcomes, you know, of the products based on their costs and their payout rates. So again, we're, we're giving, you know, whenever you shed light, you know, and give, give information, you, you then make, I think, a more competitive world. And that's, you know, one of the other goals, you know, we have for, you know, for DPL insurance carriers un- with only with super simple products have really lived in a competitive world in, in the other products, not so competitive because it's super hard to compare them, but we're, we're trying to take that away. So David, a couple of things that I think about as I look ahead to, to my retirement. So I'm at the point where I still earn enough to, to cover my living costs and I haven't, uh, uh, done any annuitization yet, but I am indeed planning to, to do it. And, Two, two things that I keep in mind. One is that you don't have to make a single decision on one day to annuitize X hundred thousands of dollars. And in fact, my plan, when I think about my own finances, is to buy a series of immediate fixed annuities over time. Uh, and that allows me to do a couple of things. One is, you know, I can buy knowing that, you know, even if the interest rates are not that favorable now, maybe they'll be more favorable two years from now. So I sort of average in. It also allows me to diversify across insurance companies. I mean, you know, never say never, but you know, it could be that the insurance company you invest with does get into financial trouble. And while there are these state guarantee funds, you know, you'd rather not go down that road. So by buying over time, not only can you spread the interest rate risk, you can also spread the credit risk across different ins- insurance companies. And then the third thing, you know, people should think about is that even if you are the person in the marriage or in the relationship, who's the one who's savvy about money, you may also be the first to go. And, you know, your husband or wife is going to be left behind to manage the financial situation. Would you like them to be managing, you know, a portfolio of stocks and bonds? Or would you like them to be getting a regular check that arrives in their checking account every month? I mean, which is going to be easier? Well, you know, to ask the question is to answer it, right? We know what is going to be easier. And even yourself, even if you are the financial savvy one in the relationship, we all know that your know, financial sort of savvy does deteriorate over time, starting at around age 65. So even if you're perfectly capable of managing a portfolio of stocks and bonds at 65, by age 80, it may be a completely different situation. You may not be as smart about money at that juncture. And again, getting that regular check into your Bank account once a month may be just the ticket. 
Yes. And, and like you said, it, it simplifies, you know, the retirement income you know, process. You know, a lot of you know, advisors, you, know, you get the traditional knock on annuities that they're complicated. You know, my response is, tell me what financial product isn't complicated underneath. It's the implementation and the use, you know, which is pretty straightforward. You know, when, when you're looking at that, and particularly if you want to compare it to like a total returns portfolio strategy, you want to talk about complicated, you know, trying to deliver retirement income for, you know, an unexpected period of time by making consistent portfolio withdrawals. Now that's complicated. Um, but let's, you know, talk, the next question we always get from advisors is, you know, once you're talking to them about the benefits of the annuities and they kind of get it is, well, how much do I allocate? You know, what, what do I look to do? So in your personal situation, you're talking about, you know, in the future here, when you're, you're not working as much anymore, you know, looking at annuities. So how do you think about it for yourself? Like, are you, is it going to be 5% or 10% or a hundred percent? What do you, what are you going to do? The first goal is to delay social security until age 70, right? I mean, social security is the best annuity you can buy and you buy it by delaying claiming benefits. So there is the goal of waiting until age 70. And so, you know, I know one of your questions was about, you know, buying a, a, an annuity that'll just bridge that gap from retirement until age 70. And I think that's a, you know, a reasonable strategy, a, a good way to use an immediate fixed annuity. Uh, I don't think it's as powerful because the thing about an immediate fixed annuity to me is that it's lifetime income. And you know, just using it for a fixed period of time doesn't seem quite as compelling, but that's certainly a use. But when I think about how much to annuitize, so one, you know, delaying Social Security is going to involve running down assets in the meantime to, while you delay. I think it's worth doing that so that you get that lifetime income starting at age 70. And then on top of that, I at least would like some additional income in part so that I do cover my fixed living costs. So I want to know that, you know, Whatever goes on in the financial markets this year or next, you know, I'm going to have enough money coming in to pay the bills and uh, maybe more than pay the bills. It depends what your bills are, right? My bills are travel, like, you know, restaurants that probably charge too much and so on. But I want to be able to continue doing all that no matter what's going on in the stock market. So I want enough money from Social Security and from my immediate fixed annuities in retirement to be able to do that and not worry. And I think that sum covering your fixed living costs and you know certain amount of discretionary spending is the way to go yeah and that that's you know generally what our response is is you know what are your clients essential expenses and essential as you say is, is defined individually um you know for um, for everyone i'm sure it's housing healthcare, food stuff like that uh you know travel golf for me. I want my golf as long as I'm physically able, um, you know, those kind of things. But, you know, it's personalizing that, you know, allocation to cover, you know, what's going to give your client peace of mind and, and enjoyment in their retirement um, is often what they want covered by essential income, your uh, guaranteed income. And just another thing worth mentioning here, David, is from an advisor point of view, there is, you know, as an academic would say, there is an agency issue, which is, you know, you don't want to be the advisor who has the client who is running out of money. <laughs> and if you have persuaded your client to delay Social Security, and if you have persuaded them to annuitize a part of their portfolio, you know that they will have lifetime income. So as bad as things get in uh, the financial market or as bad as they are at controlling their own spending, you know that they will have this stream of income and you know, that's going to be a much easier client conversation to have when they're age 80 and their portfolio of stocks and bonds is looking a bit thin saying, hey, well, all right, you know, your portfolio over here doesn't look that great, but you do have this annuity income and you did delay Social Security, so you still have enough to cover the basics. Then the person who took Social Security early and never annuitized, that's going to be a much tougher conversation. And I, for one, would not want to be that financial advisor. Right. I, I hear one of one of my pet peeves with financial advisors, too, along those lines is, you know, I hear you know, a couple of things. One, I've never had a client run out of money. And my question is, well, how many people have you managed their money from, say, age 50 to 95? The answer is zero. 
right? So the answer is zero. You, you've never actually managed a person you know, before and through retirement. So it's, it's kind of a flippant answer you know, when they're talking about guaranteed income. And, and the other is, I'll just manage their expenses. You know, and, and you know, I'll just, if the market's going up or down or whatever, I'll just manage their expenses. One, that may be not desirable to your client, but also may not be possible. You're kind of in, insinuating a level of control that you don't have. Yeah, I think you know, being an advisor in the decades ahead with the aging of the baby boomers is going to become an increasingly messy business. I mean, we've already sort of started to see hints of this with issues of, you know, what does an advisor do when they get concerned that, you know, maybe a client is the subject of, you know, theft from family members, you know, when they feel that they are no longer um, competent, you know, it, these issues are only going to get worse going forward. It's going to be a mess. And to the extent that a client has, you know, regular predictable income, it's not going to be as big a mess. So that's this will be maybe a good transition to help us start getting wrapped up. We could talk about this all day. I'm, I'm very much enjoying this. But I mean, you've spent a lot of time in financial services and observing and writing and and researching. What do you see in the you know, years ahead? So what what changes do you see? What 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 should be people and advisors be thinking about and expecting? So I think going back, David, I mean, the financial industry has actually improved vastly over the time that I've been covering the business, which has been almost four decades. I'm, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit. I mean, when I started writing about you know the the business, I mean, if, you know, commissions were huge. You know, mutual funds had eight and a half percent loads. You know, an advisor never talked about things like when you claim social security or yeah, you should go and get a will or you know, it was it was a mess. And in, in the decades since, you know, the array of products available to investors have proliferated. That's not good to the extent that it creates more confusion, but it does mean that there are many more tools for the skilled advisor and for the skilled individual to use to improve their finances. And we've also seen costs come down in most areas of the financial world. I mean, you know, when you can go out and buy you know, an S&P 500 fund and pay a couple of basis points for it. I mean, that's extraordinary. You go back to mid the mid-1980s, and I think even at that point, Vanguard was charging 40 basis points for its S&P 500 index fund. And we've seen extraordinary changes, except, alas, on the insurance side of the business. On the insurance side of the business, there's still a lot of products with, you know, enormous expenses. So, you know, I think that you are... I hope, but the sort of the sweet spot here of where there will be big changes in the years ahead. And there should be because this is an area, annuitization, taking portfolios and turning them into a stream of income that is of growing interest to in the general population and will only become more so as the, uh, the boomers get older. The big change I think that we will see in the next decade or so is you know, a rethinking of what exactly retirement is. So beyond all the issues that everybody's already talking about, you know, long-term care, you know, what should the withdrawal rate be on the portfolio and so on, I think we're going to see a redefinition of retirement to the extent that you know, we can't really afford to have everybody leaving the workforce at an average age of 62 and sitting around doing nothing for the rest of their lives. I mean, at a, at a, budget point of view, I mean, the federal government, you know, cannot sustain, you know, social security benefits at that level. You know, we as a society cannot have a society where, you know, we have too few workers and too many dependents, too many people who are hinging on their, their labor. You know, you can have all the stocks and bonds in the world. You can have all the money you want in the bank. But if there are not the people to produce the goods and services that you want to buy with that money, you know, something's going to go wrong. And that thing that's probably going to go wrong is much higher inflation. So what we will see, I think, in the decade ahead is more and more people staying in the workforce for longer, 
and or those who are retired looking to work part time in retirement. I think we're going to see companies change the way they behave so they retain older workers. They can design jobs that have more flexible hours that can be done from home that are not as physically strenuous because they will want these workers. They will need these workers. And all in all, I think it's a good thing. I don't think it's healthy to have somebody leave the workforce at 62 and spend the next 30 years, you know, sitting around watching TV. And I hate to say this to you, David, and playing golf. You know, I think, <laughs> I think we need people to be active in the community, to give themselves a sense of purpose. It's really important. You know, retirement, sitting around doing nothing is not a good retirement. And um, so not only is it good for the individual, but it will also be good for society because we need folks to remain productive members of society for longer. Yeah, ag agreed. You know, even though there is a tremendous amount of streaming content out there, maybe you could keep yourself busy watching TV. Um, we, the point is tremendous. You know, there, you know, we can't have too few people supporting too many, you know, too few workers supporting too many retirees puts too much pressure on the system all around. Um, well, any parting thoughts, Jonathan? This has been a, a true pleasure and I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think the only thing that I would encourage advisors to do, and I think a lot of advisors already do a great job of this, is to have a conversation with your clients, an ongoing conversation that is about much more than money. Because in the end, you know, money is just a tool. Money is a tool to lead a better life. And the Agree that you know your clients really well, what they're passionate about, what they're frightened about. You can be a better advisor. I mean, this connection between money and the rest of our lives, you know, is another area that I think we're going to explore in great detail in the decades ahead. We've had the revolution caused by behavioral finance. We've had the revolution that's been caused by all the research on money and happiness. I think this whole area of the psychology of money and how to make people happier with their financial lives and to help them to get more out of the money that they amass is going to be hugely important. And advisors, good advisors, have an opportunity to deliver enormous value to, value to their clients by focusing on this area. And if they do, then you know, clients will be lining up to work with them. I, I love that and I'm a huge believer in it. And one, one small thing we do, you know, for our advisor set is, you know, there's a, a new you know, questionnaire out there called RISA, Retirement Income Style Awareness, which was developed by, you know, uh, Wade Fow and another you know, psychologist, Alex Merguia, to let advisors ask their clients what their preferences are for retirement income. Right. Instead of just saying, here's the, here's your total return portfolio. Here's how I'm going to do it. It's tell me what's important to you. Right. And, and that's just one piece of what you're talking about. But, you know, the, it's, it's something we can bring to it uh, and give advisors a tool to help in those kind of conversations. But, you know, a huge believer in that kind of getting to know your clients, what's important to them much more than just you know, numbers and, and dollars and, and things like that. Uh, tremendous, tremendously important. So again, thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. This has been tremendous. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation and uh, we'll look forward to catching up again sometime soon. Great, great luck with the book. Oh, thank you, David. It's been a fun conversation. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Thanks for watching. Visit dplfp.com to learn how we can work with advisors like you. And please, for more updates, subscribe to this channel.